and welcome back to another Hearthstone video. So today what we're going to do is expand on the deck building videos that I've done so far, and we're going to talk a little bit about more advanced value calculations. We're going to talk today about activation cost and risk factors. And so uh, for this video I'm going to assume that you've already watched my first one that I ever did, I believe, on the basics of value, the vanilla test, stat distribution, that sort of thing. Um, I've also just written an article about that on Hearthstone players, so uh, the link for that's in the description if you'd like a text representation, and the link to the video is in the description as well. So check those out before we talk about what I'm going to talk about today. I'm going to assume you know what I'm talking about. So what I want to talk about today is activation cost primarily, and risk. So when we talk about the vanilla test, there are all these cards that you can judge very easily whether or not it passes or not, you know? So if you go to something like the Demolisher, it doesn't pass the vanilla test, but it has an effect that might make it worth it. The Dollar on Mage doesn't pass the vanilla test, and it's just usually considered a bad card. Then you have other cards like the Earth and Ring Farseer that do pass the test, and they have extra effects on top of it, and it's easy to see why it gets included in a lot of decks. Today I want to talk about some of the weird ones. Some of the cards that don't look very promising initially, but actually have some merit to them. And I want to talk about how you can figure out what activation cost is, and essentially how cards that are more complicated work. So, what do I mean when I say activation cost? Well, the best example, I think, the simplest example, is this guy right here. The Ancient Watcher. This is in a lot of decks. And you can see why. If you look at it just for the vanilla test, Think about this. It's a Yeti for half of the mana, right? It's nine stats for two cost. That's incredible. That's four times its value. Or uh, two times its value, rather. And so it's amazing as a card, as, as far as just stats are concerned, but it's more complicated than that because it can't attack. And so when you play this on the field on its own, it's useless. It's a dead card. Your opponent will ignore it 90% of the time. And it'll just sit there. And so what you need to make this card effective is an activation somehow. You need to activate this card. There are two really common ways of activating it that I'll talk about. Um, the first is very well known, and it is uh, this card right here, is the Sun Fury Protector. It is two mana, and it gives adjacent minions taunt. And so if we taunt up the Ancient Watcher, it's activated, because essentially it has gone from being useless to being useful. Uh, now the enemy cannot ignore it anymore, and they're forced to deal with it. So, uh, and, and it works as a very good early taunt. If you coin Ancient Watcher and then Sun Fury Protector on turn 2, you have a taunted 4-5, uh, which is really exceptional. The other way you can activate it, using the same trick, um, coin out the Ancient Watcher and then use a minion, uh, the Iron Beak Owl is the other one. It silences a minion. And so if you kill that card text, what happens is it now is just a Yeti for 2 mana. It is, however, more complicated than that, because you have to consider the activation cost in there. So, what I mean by that is, in order to actually make this useful, you actually have to spend four mana, not two, right? Now, you get an extra minion with that. You get the Iron Beak Owl, and you get the Sun Fury Protector, but you have to spend four mana over two turns in order to make that minion do anything. And more importantly, if you use the Owl, you're actually blowing a silence that you could use for somebody else's creature, for an enemy's creature, on your own creatures. And so there is potential there for them to then put something out that you could not remove because you've used up your silences already. So the active, there's risk involved in that, and as an activation factor you need another card. At bare minimum it costs two cards and four mana to make this card worth anything. Does that make it a bad card? No it doesn't but it's important to understand what happens as a result of needing to activate this. What it actually, the net effect of all of this, is that you get a 4-5 on the board very, very early in the game. If it happens later on, it's actually pretty bad, but if it happens early, it's excellent. And so you are taking a risk and using more cards than normal to get something very scary early on the board. So there's risk involved there, and there's an activation cost. Those are the basic things that I'm going to be talking about today with some other creatures. Um, and so activation in its simplest way then, its simplest definition as far as I'm concerned, is making a useless card or a not very valuable card much more valuable with some method. Okay, So activation cost can, this is a very good example because it's useless to useful immediately, black and white. Um, however, 
let's look at a card like the Raid Leader. We looked at that when we talked about the Vanilla Test initially because it's not a very good card. Um, and it fails the Vanilla Test. But we're going to look at it in a bit more detail right now. So the card has four stats, and it needs six in order to actually pass the Vanilla Test. So what does it actually need to become valuable? It needs some method by which to obtain two more stats, right? It buffs your other minions' attacks. And so what that means is that if we have two minions on the table, it gives one stat to each of them. And therefore the Raid Leader is responsible for six stats on the board, even though it's not his own. And he's good enough for his mana cost at that point. So there's a prerequisite for him. There's a prerequisite activation, if you want to put it in the big terms, that essentially says, if there are two minions on the board, it is useful to play the Raid Leader. If there aren't two minions on the board, the Raid Leader isn't very valuable. Okay, so uh, it's that simple. It's one of those sort of binary things. Now, there's an option that it can be more valuable than just its normal cost, because if you have more than two minions on the board, it buffs even more stats, so it's much more useful. Now, the likelihood of that happening is very low, and so essentially, if you include a raid leader in your deck, you are incurring a lot of potential risk because you are hoping that your board will be full enough to merit playing the Raid Leader, and if it isn't, you're going to have to play him at some point in an unfavorable circumstance. So that's why not a lot of people play the Raid Leader. Now, a lot of people, on the other hand, will play Direwolf Alpha, which is sort of the Raid Leader's superior uh, lower counterpart, counterpart. He is a 2-2 two -two for 2, so he's inherently valuable, and he has the same trick as the Raid Leader for the minions beside him. Which means if you have two minions on the table, he will give them a bonus. And he will be worth six stats instead of four. And that means that he's actually much better than his value. And so the raid leader actually has to make up a lot more ground. Because the direwolf does his job for one mana less. So that's why not a lot of people play the raid leader. There's a lot less risk involved with the direwolf. Because at the end of the day, it's a 2-2 two -two for two. So even if you play it on an empty board, it's still fine. So that's essentially one example of a sort of a prerequisite. Instead of, instead of activation, per se, a prerequisite for it to be valuable. Um, more of an activation would be this guy here, the Tauren Warrior. So it's a 2-3 three for 3, which is bad. Um, it is 5 stats as opposed to 6, which it should be. But it has this Enrage feature, that if it gets hit with 2 damage or less... Uh, otherwise it'll die, essentially. But if you don't buff it, if he gets hit for 2 damage or less, it'll enrage, and it will be worth 3 attack, which means... Or, sorry, it'll be worth uh, 5 attack. And therefore it will be 5-3, which is 8 stats for 3, which is just fine. That's much more valuable than it needs to be. The reason not a lot of people play this card is for the exact same trick. The likelihood of it being activated is very small. Most players will not knowingly play into an enrage like that. They'll try to avoid it. So they will hit it with three damage somehow, or you know, somehow negate the enrage effect. Which means the likelihood of you actually getting the value out of it is quite small. And because when you get the value out of it, as with most enrages, when you get the value out of it, it's going to be so weak it will only be around for one turn, probably at maximum. So there's a lot of risk involved in playing the Tauren Warrior, um, and a lot of people don't think it's worth it. I certainly don't. And so its activation is not worth the risk of playing it. If we look at another card like the Cult Master, the Cult Master is an interesting one because you can actually guarantee its status. It is, it doesn't pass the vanilla test, it's six stats where it should be eight, but what its effect is, is it gets you cards when your minions die. And so the trick is to play this on the field at the same time that you are going to knowingly trade a couple of minions into your enemy. So this is a smaller risk than the other two creatures, because it's not dependent upon the opponent so much as it's dependent on you. You still need to have at least one minion on the board. Generally speaking, cards are worth about a mana and a half, or a mana or so. Um, and so call it a point, two points. So if you... Uh, if you get one card out of it, it's about right. That's all you really need. If you get two cards out of it, then you're certainly doing well. And so you need at least one minion on the board to trade away. But you can control when you play this. And so the likelihood is you can get its value at some point. The problem is that if you are behind, and if you're like well out of control, 
Um, if the opponent is out-tempoing you, whatever else, it's not a very great card, because essentially, if you have to play it on its own, it only has two life. And so the likelihood that it will stay alive is very small, and the likelihood that it will do its damage is also very small. That could be taken out with a spell very quickly, very easily. And so the activation on the Cult Master is not as hard to do, uh, and it's more valuable than the other two in my opinion, but it's still a risk involved in playing it. Final example on this, uh, on this score of sort of uh, value, activation, and risk is this guy, the Gurubashi Berserker. So, interestingly enough, this also doesn't pass the vanilla test. It's 9 stats for 5, it should be 10. But whenever this minion takes any damage, it gains 3 attack. Okay? So if it gets hit once, it passes the vanilla test, with flying colors actually. It actually goes up then to 12 stats for, uh, for 5 mana, which is excellent. If you can activate it yourself, if you're a warrior or something like this, um, it's quite likely that you will be able to play this in a valuable way. Now, the interesting thing about this is that a lot of people don't consider this to be a risk, playing this card, but it actually is, because you're betting that they won't remove this before it gets its damage in, or before it, it uh, builds up a little bit. The likelihood that you will be able to get its value, though, is actually quite high. It has 7 health, and so the likelihood that somebody can kill it in one turn is a lot less than something like the Cult Master, where you basically can't play that on an open board if you expect it to live. So it is a risk to play the Gurubash Berserker, and in a lot of cases, because of the low attack and the weird stat distribution for the cost, you don't see it getting played a lot, especially outside of Warrior decks. But it's actually a risk that is a good one. The likelihood that you can get its value is high, and the activation's not hard to do. With so much health, you can crash this into basically anything. The major problem is actually that once you crash it into something, if it takes a couple of damage, three, four, five damage, it's going to be a lot easier to kill with that five attack or eight attack. And so the likelihood that it can trade for more than one or two things is actually quite small. And so, because it will absolutely be a, a high priority target. So uh, that's why you don't see it as much. But it's interesting because it sort of illustrates this, this um, risk reward thing that we have here. So, uh, that's the main thing I want to talk about as far as activation cost and risk. When you play cards, you need to look at what they say on them, and you need to figure out whether or not the minion passes the vanilla test already. So if we look at something like the Raging Worgen, Raging Worgen is a good example here, it passes the vanilla test as it is. It's a 3-3 three, three for 3. Done. The question though is how likely is it that it's going to achieve more than its value? How likely is it that you can milk it for all of its worth? And uh, that's when you consider how likely it is you want it in your deck. Do you think you can reliably get that extra Wind Fury plus one attack? The likelihood is with the Worgen, not really. Uh, unless you're playing a Warrior deck where you can reliably self-enrage, or a Mage deck, uh, the likelihood that it will stay on the table is quite small. People are afraid of this card, and rightfully so, I think. Um, and so that's something to consider as well. Things like the Thralmar Farseer is another good one. It is below average stats, and doesn't pass the vanilla test. But you have to consider when you're putting this in your deck, is it likely that it will live for one turn to do its Wind Fury damage? Because it's really, if you think about it that way, it can be a 4-3. Um, although Wind Fury, unless you're hitting the hero, it's not really a 4-3. It might be able to trade for two things that are smaller uh, in one turn, but Wind Fury on something with so little health and so little attack is... Uh, usually not all that valuable, but you have to consider when you want to play it, what are the risks involved in me playing this, and whether or not is it going to be able to actually do its job. That's, that's the key. Um, one last thing I want to touch on very briefly before the end of this video. Um, this came up on the comment thread of this article that I published recently. What about overload? Overload is an interesting question because essentially it reduces all the mana cost that you have to pay up front for something that is actually much more powerful than it should be that early in the game. And when you're dealing with this, the real key is to try to isolate whether the early play is worth the value loss. Okay? So, look at the Earth Elemental. The Earth Elemental, if you consider the overload to be part of the mana cost, which you should, it doesn't actually hit its required stats. It is 15 stats for 8 mana, which is not quite enough. The Taunt helps it a little bit, so it makes it just about on par for value, but 
still not very much. Um, so the question is, does the fact that you can play it on turn five make up for this? In my opinion, I don't, I don't tend to run them because I think they're very, very vulnerable to a lot of things. Taunt opens it up to the Black Knight, and seven attack means big game hunter, uh, in addition to any sort of hard removal. And if you play it on turn five, that overload is absolutely crippling. So it's a lot of risk to play this card. But there's a lot of reward, too, because if the enemy doesn't have an answer, they're basically screwed, right? A 7-8 on turn 5 is very hard to deal with, unless you have one of the two or three answers. So it can win you a lot of games. But it's important when we're looking at this to understand that you do have to take into account the fact that this is part of the mana cost. If you look at something like Lightning Storm, it looks amazing. It's three mana for a Consecration, essentially, plus potential to be more than a Consecration. But it's actually five cost, right? So it's actually right about on par, but you have to be careful about how you use this. I would say the Lightning Storm is much more valuable than something like a Consecrate, because you can... The value with having huge AoE spells is the ability to play them whenever you need to. And being able to play it two turns earlier is absolutely phenomenal. Well, two turns earlier than its actual cost, not Consecration. For an AoE spell, that's incredible, and I think it's very, very powerful. Same thing with Feral Spirit. Being able to play two taunts down whenever you need them, even though it should cost five, and it does, uh, getting them out two turns ahead is actually really very valuable. Most of the Shaman's abilities that do this, I think, are actually quite valuable, and I like the overload mechanic. But when we're talking about the Shaman, it is very important to understand that it is a part of the cost, and it will eat into your next turn, and you have to plan for it. So you have to wonder whether or not it's worth playing it early for the fact that your next turn is going to be weaker. So that's a risk involved with that as well. So uh, to sum up, essentially, the real key that I wanted to get across in this video is when you're looking at creatures that have card text that's sort of conditional, pay attention to their activation cost and what you need in order to actually make a creature worth it. What do you need to make it so that this creature can achieve its full value? If it's a creature like the Raging Worgen, where it already achieves its full value, then it's a better question, right? You're asking, how can I use this card to the fullest extent, and how likely is it that I can milk it? If you're looking at something like the Raid Leader, though, you actually have to wonder quite a bit, is its effect enough to justify how bad it is stat-wise? Uh, how likely is it that on a regular basis I will be able to achieve its, its full value? For the record, that's one of the reasons why the Defender of Argus has seen less play lately. Uh, it, it does keep coming back, and it's still very powerful because of the 1-1 buffs and taunts, but in order for this to be effective, in order for it to get its stat value, it actually does need to buff two creatures, not just one. Otherwise, it actually does fail the vanilla test. So it's important to understand that when you're including the Defender of Argus in the deck, you're actually putting in some level of risk, because you are hoping, you're, you're uh, banking on the fact that you're going to have a board of at least two creatures when you play that, to really attain its max value. In any way, any case, thanks so much for watching, guys. I, uh, I hope you enjoyed this. If you have any questions about deck building or whatever else, let me know, and I'll think about it for covering in more future deck building videos and that sort of a thing. I'm always looking for new topics to cover, and I'm always interested in um, trying to actually aim these at what people want to see, because, of course, I'm happy to talk about a lot of stuff, and I want to make something that my viewers enjoy. So uh, thanks so much for watching, and I will talk to you guys next time.